Hello DevOps friends, it's Ruby Tuesday here on Full Stack Live. Welcome, welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever you are, you are very welcome. How is everyone? Let's see, I'm doing quite good. Um, so far it's been a productive week. Uh, it's been a very interesting week uh, in terms of um, new things that I'm trying out. And uh, so that's always something that um, keeps my energy levels high. If I can learn something, if there is anything that I can ex explore or uh, investigate, um, I'm having fun and fun is always good. Um, what I'm talking about is note taking. I've uh, realized that um, note taking does help uh, with retaining knowledge. Um, and uh, I'm quite confused by the fact that it took me so long to realize that. Of course, I always uh, have been talking, uh, taking notes, um, but uh, never in a very structured way. Um, I wrote down things, quick notes during a call or things that um, I needed to reference later. But um, especially with um, knowledge, I didn't have any kind of a structured approach and um, so the the more or less the only form of stuff that I um, stored was bookmarks and um, I didn't even care for them too much because um, they tend to um, expire over time, websites go down or articles get um, deleted or um, hosted under a different URL, things like that. So um, TLDR, I, I did not have any kind of um, knowledge base or something like that. I tried wikis over, over time, but um, it, it never stuck for my personal knowledge, even though we have a quite uh, nice uh, company wiki, uh, which is based on Notion. Um, we, uh, I pers personally did not have any kind of um, note-taking uh, approach. Maker Blaker, welcome. Hope you're doing great. Um, so yeah, um, recently um, the Zettelkasten approach and uh, uh, the Rome Research website uh, are very much talked about. And that spurred my interest, of course, because I'm always interested in productivity and in, in things like that. Um, and um, I did not yet um, get to use it because they um, have a, a trickle in um, approach at the moment just to keep their user numbers in uh, manageable uh, amounts. However, I uh, did um, start using my uh, own personal note taking app uh, and I'm using bear notes for that um, to write down things um, for example write down excerpts from stuff that I'm reading uh, write down uh, a few paragraphs on an article that I've read on the web and uh, I have started linking them um, either um, between each other or at least to an index note uh, that uh, basically um, keeps a, a certain topic together and so far this has been quite interesting because um, I feel that um, I'm storing things uh, in a way that I can retrieve quickly later and um, I'm at the moment I'm, I'm very um, keen on, on extending this and uh, um, making sure that my number of notes it keeps going up and things like that so um, yeah, that, that has been quite interesting. Hello, Division by Zero. Hello, Marcus. Welcome. Nice to have you here. I'm uh, talking about my uh, newly found note-taking passion. Um, so, um, yeah, I've been trying to take notes on all topics that uh, interest me at the moment. And, and that's a wide variety. It's uh, technical topics. It's... Uh, uh, political stuff, uh, 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 which is uh, not surprising in, in the uh, recent climate. 
Um, uh, things that interest me and that I'd like to reference or, or read up again um, uh, is going into my notes and uh, at least it feels like like it's um, like I'm getting somewhere and uh, I'm I'm pretty happy about that. We'll see in a few weeks time uh, how it goes if it's just a jumbled mess or if there is uh, actually some order uh, going to emerge out of the chaos of my notes. Um, I don't know yet, but uh, it's a nice experiment and I'll be happy to report back in uh, due time. Do you have any um, kind of note-taking approach or is, is there a way that you make sure that you can um, uh, refresh your memory about things that are interesting or important to you? I'd be very much curious um, how you approach these things. Simply pop into chat and let me know. And on that note, um, uh, this is a very chat-friendly channel, so please um, don't hold back with anything that you'd like to ask or to share. Um, pop into Twitch chat and uh, let's get into our conversation about whatever um, tickles your fancy. Uh, let me think, is there anything else that I'd like to share now that we are in the show and tell uh, phase of the stream? Um, yeah, I'm a little bit excited about um, uh, a new keyboard that I'm going to build. Uh, I'm still uh, unsure if I'm going to share my build on, on stream because um, I'm not yet um, uh, too great in, in terms of soldering and things like that. And uh, you have to deal with uh, shaking fingers and things like that. So uh, I'm not sure if I'm uh, still um, already up to the task of doing that in public. But um, yeah, I'm trying something new. Um, so far, I've always be been using the normal staggered keyboard layouts, uh, like the normal ANSI layout mainly and um, the Happy Hacking Keyboard layout. However, now I'm going to try something new. And Marcus, um, that will um, uh, probably interest you because you have the uh, keyboard I.O. one. Um, I'm going to try a, an uh, isometric layout, a column uh, staggered layout myself. Um, and that's going to be the first time I'm, that I'm doing that. I got myself a very affordable um, keyboard kit and I'm going to build that. And then we'll see um, if it's actually going to be um, uh, better than what I've been used to so far. Uh, the uh, keyboard is a Lily 58. Uh, it's a split keyboard um, with with two halves that you can uh, place on your desk and uh, that are um, connected with a cable. And um, so, yeah, it's going to be new. I've been uh, using split keyboards before, but only with uh, the traditional layouts. And uh, so uh, we'll see how it goes. It's probably going either going to be a, a very uh, refreshing um, exercise or it's quickly going to turn up that uh, I'm not built for author linear keyboards at all. We'll see how my brain is going to de deal with that. Yeah, no, you, you need to get uh, trained with the uh, one again. Uh, we will do we can we, we might be able to do a challenge uh who has uh the the highest uh, wpm after say four weeks or so um okay so that being said i guess uh, yeah i can imagine that uh, it's really hard to uh, train yourself to use this uh isometric layout where all the key caps are aligned in in basically in, in a grid um, or in a, a little bit of a distorted grid but not as staggered as uh, as the traditional keyboards I haven't uh, used any keyboards like that before so we'll see how it goes all right folks so um, today I'm going to do uh, a little bit of chef infrastructure coding and uh, I'll explain what I'm going to do in a minute.
If you've done any infrastructure coding yourself, if you have built some kind of automation for um, maybe a virtual machine or a, a web server that you are running on, on the web or something like that, um, then you've probably approached things from, from the same starting point as I have, and that is scripts. Small little things that um, you uh, write as uh, you need them and um, that simply um, implement a linear um, uh, order of, of commands that set up a web server or something like that. For me, that changed when I uh, discovered Chef about uh, 11 years ago and um, I learned how to build Chef cookbooks which basically are collections of Ruby scripts that um, already have functionality built in to deal with common system resources. For example, you can create files, for example, configuration files. Um, you can uh, create directories. You can install software packages. You can uh, start uh, and configure services like a web server, for example. Um, all these things um, are possible in a, quite an easy way in the form of um, chef cookbooks. And let me pull one up for you. This is our cookbook repository that we are using at uh, our company. And um, let's simply uh, use the uh, Apache cookbook here. I'll scroll up a little bit because I think that's going to be a little bit easier to read. So here, for example, you can see um, that uh, this uh, chef recipe cookbooks are um, consist of a bunch of recipes. Um, and um, so this recipe here, for example, uh, takes care of a file. Um, cookbook file means there is a file coming with this cookbook um, uh, stored under the files directory here. And um, this is the file name. So under files, we'll find an Apache directory and there is a launch node site.sh. And um, this definition here tells Chef to use this file to copy it onto the machine where this recipe is running. And um, it is going to store that under opt box bin launch node site.sh. And this file is going to get uh, root as an owner and as its group and the 755 mode, which means it's uh, read writable by the owner and um, readable by uh, the group and everyone else. And it's going to be executable for everyone. That's basically the octal um, representation of the file permissions. And you might already be familiar with that. Uh, and here we have a, a full directory that gets uh, populated by our cookbook. Here we have a resource that comes from a different cookbook. Um, this uh, our Apache 2 Frysteel cookbook defines a resource called default site that allows us to easily define the default website in an Apache server. Um, and uh, these uh, attributes tell Chef where to get the source information. And um, in that way, you uh, um, put one resource under the other and start building your stuff. So far, that's not too hard. Um, you quickly get uh, uh, acquainted with all the default re uh, resources and maybe even re resources that are provided by other cookbooks. Um, that's pretty straightforward. The next thing I learned about um, uh, Chef is that Chef is not only written in Ruby, these recipes are actually Ruby too. And so we can use all Ruby language features, for example, we can use um, conditionals, we can also um, use iterators and loops. And um, so all the language features that Ruby offers us allow us to um, extend our recipes 
and um, build more complex stuff. For example, here I'm going to iterate over all websites that need to be installed or configured on a web server. And um, this uh, sites.each is a huge loop that sets up all kinds of things for each and every single website. Uh, these websites are get returned from this method here, which I've put into uh, its own module, so we have it contained a little bit. Okay, so we can use Ruby for, for our recipes, that's great, and um, that got me actually into Ruby programming, and um, uh, yeah, I, I uh, en have been enjoying Ruby programming ever since. Um, but, and that brings me to my task for today, um, if a recipe or a whole cookbook, so a bunch of recipes, get more complex and longer, just like this recipe here, things get harder to maintain. Especially if you are dealing with a big data set. And um, I think I can... yeah, look at that. Here I'm writing an Apache site configuration file. If you've ever configured Apache, you're pretty familiar with that. Um, that's the normal configuration where you define, okay, um, uh, where are the files of this website on the file system, which domains are, um, is, is this website going to run under, uh, and things like that. And here um, you can see that we create a configuration file from a template. So this template is a file that comes with the recipe. Uh, that has placeholders in it. It's uh, similar to uh, uh, Rails views. It's even uh, the same language. It's ERB. So um, uh, you have these placeholders in your template that you can then replace. And uh, that things are pretty complex is easy to tell if you take a look at this list of um, instance variables that we are passing into this template. And each of these uh, variables actually gets its value from uh, a variable or um, from something that is derived from a variable. So there's a variable site name, site username, site group name, site local, site shared, etc, etc. And um, this is where things are going south pretty quickly because, um, for example, if you are actually, if these are actual variable names, um, it's easy to mistype them. And suddenly you have lots of nil values where you don't expect them, simply because um, the variable name that you are referencing does not yet exist. Things are a little bit better if these are actual methods, functions, and uh, you can't tell from, from this invocation, from this expression uh, by itself. I would have to look it up if site group name is a variable or a method. Um, if it is a method, um, uh, there's no difference yet, I just realized. Mm, we'll just get, um, well, Ruby will still interpret, if this method does not exist, Ruby will still interpret it as a, a variable and uh, it's probably going to use a nil value here. Which will make this, uh, or it's, it's a fact that this makes this recipe pretty much uh, hard to maintain. Um, you run into typos, and if your test suite doesn't um, discover them, you're going to deploy a, a bug into production, and uh, somehow you will have an unexpected behavior, and then you'll have to debug things, and uh, yeah, things get ugly quite quickly. And that's because 
and I've realized that far too late. Um, that's because you need to apply software engineering um, approaches to your infrastructure code as well. Um, someone who builds a, a bash script, for example, uh, that in the end has hundreds of lines, probably realizes, okay, uh, we are uh, reaching a level of, of complexity um, that it's hard to maintain, and uh, they are either going to break it up into multiple bash scripts, or they will actually try and replace it with uh, something built in a, um, well, I'd say real programming language um, that allows more modularity and things like that. And uh, that's what we need to apply to this code as well. An easy way to apply software engineering principles to uh, this Ruby script is to introduce classes, objects. Because as soon as I introduce an object, for example, named site, that has an attribute, aka a method name, I can call it with site period name. And uh, if I now make a typo, Ruby will discover that because either the object name will not be found and then we can't um, call a name method on an unknown object, or I mistype the method name and um, then um, Ruby will tell me, well, the site object does exist, but there's no method um, Nima, for example. And uh, that will make things quite obvious if I, I make a typo. And uh, our maintainability will be much, much better. On top of everything, this object might be able to be, uh, I might be able to test this object in, um, in an isolated way. I can actually write unit tests for this object, or for this class, to be more precise. And um, so uh, that will uh, drive up maintainability even, even further. Lone Wolf N7, hello, welcome to Full Stack Live. How are you doing today? And uh, Mission Crit, hello, good evening to you as well. How are things over in Germany? So that's exactly what I'm going to do here. I'm going to introduce um, a site object, and I'll have to define the class for this object. Um, and that will allow us to uh, uh, make this code a lot more maintainable and clean. We can test it and uh, quickly discover if you've made any errors. Look at how we are processing stuff here. That's typical of uh, scripts that get extended and extended and extended uh, over time, and they get less and less maintainable. If I can contain this, uh, all that stuff in uh, a class with private methods, for example, that are only used internally, things will get cleaned up quite a bit. Nothing special in Germany. Well, yeah, um, I can't give you any uh, significant updates from Ireland as well. Uh, things are pretty cloudy outside, so um, yeah, it's it's uh, been uh, drizzling from time to time today. And I'm quite happy to be here inside with my coffee and with you folks. Still working with the stream in the background. Same here, same here. I'm still working with you all in the background. All right, so how are we going to deal with this? Well, turns out uh, I've already may, uh, made a few preparations because um, I've realized um, the need of um, a little bit more object orientation. Uh, earlier when I uh, revamped or restructured or um, uh, what's the what's the word um, I'm blanking on the word uh, oh come on <laughs> it 
it's amazing how how, how the brain uh, goes into blackout for for very common words. Um, uh, I mean, if you are uh, cleaning up code and things like that, um, what's that called? Oh, it'll come back. And you're probably going to tell me in a second anyway. Um, refactoring. There it is. Um, so there is actually a separate cookbook called Freiselbox Data where we don't have any recipes. This cookbook only offers libraries and these libraries um, define tada classes. Classes that have um, certain um, methods that will allow us to uh, retrieve information in this case about a website and uh, that's exactly what I'm going to use uh, as the basis of my introduction of, of my refactoring here. Before I go into the details, I'm going to do what I always do. We'll have to create a new branch. And uh, in this case, there should already be an issue um, that references this. I'm just not sure how to find it. So um, maybe we can actually search by the Freistil box label. Mm, wait. Label equals cookbook slash Freistil box. We have, an, we have a label for every of our, each and every of our cookbooks. So let's see. Uh, and uh, it's probably quite an old of an issue because uh, we've been having this problem for quite a while. Here, issue number 168, opened two years ago by me, inflationary use of variables. That's exactly what I'd like to resolve today. So this is issue number 168. And as you can see, we are closing issues in the 500s at the moment. This issue, 168, has been around for a while. We probably should have celebrated a few birthdays with this issue. So, um, <clears throat> let me make sure that my master branch is up to date. And uh, yes, it is. So, I'll... Uh, call this 168 Freisty box variables. Introducing the Freister Box Data Cookbook as a dependency will um, make things a little bit more complex. And it's also going to make development a little bit more complex because um, now we have this um, uh, uh, mutual dependency that um, Freister Box Data might not offer a functionality that we are going to need in the Freistil Box cookbook. And uh, so um, I'm going to first introduce the dependency to Freistil Box data into our Freistil Box cookbook. That way the first step is done. Um, and uh, if I actually discover that we need to uh, require a little bit more from our classes here, then I'm going to create new issues in our issue queue, and then uh, I'll first uh, I'll switch to the Freistil Box Data Cookbook, extend it as needed, and um, then we can use the newly created um, the newly created functionality. Yes, .rb is Ruby. However, um, this um, 
the context I'm using Ruby in here is Chef Infra, which is a software that allows you to um, automate server setup. Um, my company runs a hosting platform and we are running um, many hundreds of servers, Linux servers, um, some uh, are hardware servers, others are virtual. And um, uh, so automation is very much uh, needed in this context. And so I'm primarily working on uh, infrastructure automation code. And that's um, what's called a domain specific language. It's still Ruby behind the scenes, but uh, Ruby itself does not have a remote di directory command, for example. Uh, that's something that gets uh, provided by Chef. Um, in the end, it's simply a method call um, if I dissect this a little bit, um, you can actually uh, see that it's a method call. Here we call the remote directory method. Thankfully, Ruby does not require us to use parentheses around the arguments. So um, this is our um, first argument, this file.join call. And this here <laughs> is actually our second parameter that we pass into the remote directory method and that's a whole code block spanning from do to end. You can actually um, pass code blocks to a method in Ruby. So this remote directory method takes two arguments of um, a file path and um, a code block. And in turn this code block has method calls uh, here we call a source method and pass a string. We call an owner method passing a string, a group method passing a string, and a mode method passing an octal number. And um, this code block is going to be executed by Chef when it makes sense to Chef. Um, and uh, that way, this all is still Ruby, but it's um, made in a way that it looks like its own language. Uh, an infrastructure or automation language. And that's the, the great thing about Chef. Um, you can basically turn plain Ruby into a domain-specific automation language. Or in a, in a domain-specific language, in this case, the, the domain is infrastructure automation. Uh, and uh, I did not realize that uh, until, I guess, a few months in using Chef. And you can do that um, for other um, use cases as well. Uh, Ruby is uh, pretty well set up to uh, build a DSL on it. So, um, back to what I'm going to do is I'm going to add Freistelbox data to our dependencies, and uh, it actually is already a dependency, which is nice. So uh, we can go ahead and make more use of this dependency. Freistelbox data in version 1.0 or greater. Which version do we actually have? It's 1.0, okay, nice. So the dependency is already in there. So the next thing that I'm going to do is already done. Um, we are already using the website class here. We create a new website object from uh, information that we got from our chef server. Uh, that's basically a hash with lots of information about a website, its domains and databases and all kinds of stuff. And we create this website object. And I'm curious if we are already using this website object actually. So let's find out. Oh yes, look at that. We are using it here in website to get um, the domains and to get um, something that's called Apache alias regex. Okay. 
And that's it, I think. Yeah. So there's a slight little start already made. And we can uh, extend from there. For example... I guess it's a good start to, to try and... Um, replace these variables here. For example, site name. Site name. First of all, I'm going to check if Rice Box data, if the website class provides something that's called site name. Yes, it does. And now we have to make sure that uh, the site name variable on one side is the same uh, information as the site name uh, method on the other side. Uh, so let's go to the definition of site name. That must be something at the start of our loop here. And here we are mm, defining site name with a different method that also seems to come out of the Freisdebox namespace, but in this case that's a simple library with a few methods. It's not a class. And that's why we don't have an object here, but instead uh, we call it um, as a class method. And let's take a look at the name for site method. Uh, that's here in the recipe helpers file, which has become quite long as well. And uh, that's another sign that it's time to apply software engineering principles. So here we have the site name for site, uh, self name for site method. And that simply takes the site ID and prepends it with an S, which uh, we're going to see is the same as the site name method in our class. So the first change we could make is actually um, to replace this procedure call With a method call. Whoops. So, website site name. We'll do the same as the previous method call. But now we are using the, the class provided by the other cookbook. And um, that way, over time, I'll be able to replace, uh, first of all, these internal procedures with method calls on the website object. That would be phase one of our refactoring. And uh, as soon as we uh, have replaced all the right sides of these um, assignments, I'll be able to get rid of these variables and wherever I'm using site underscore name, I can actually use website period site name. And that way we'll then get rid of all these um, hard to handle variables. But one step after the other. So um, that's site name. How about site ID? Um, here we call normalize site ID on um, the ID field of this site hash. And um, let's see what uh, the website class does. That. This file here is not interesting, so we'll close it. Website class. Um, We don't offer a site ID method here, so the most straightforward um, thing doesn't exist. However, um, this class or this object actually gets initialized with this site hash. And uh, the website class actually 
passes through all the attribute names of this site hash as attribute readers. It should, it does actually offer them as accessors, which I would not do again with what I know today. Um, back then I probably used that without much thinking. These should be readers only. Um, we should not be able to um, modify these values from the outside. Um, that's far too open hearted here. Um, but yeah, it is as, as it is. And by instance variable set, we actually create accessors for all these fields. So we don't have to define actual methods for them. Uh, Ruby does it for us in the form of this instance variable set call here. So we could actually get to each field of the site hash here, but we don't have to do that because, um, well, here we have site ID. And uh, we can actually go ahead and uh, replace that with the ID method or um, attribute that got created in the way I've demonstrated earlier. So we can replace that with website.id. That's the first step in the right direction. Same here, site client ID. Is that an accessor as well? It's not yet. So I'm actually going to create an issue where I'm going to list all the hash fields that we need to make available here. So I create a new issue. Make all attributes of the website data bag item available in website class. The website class does not yet provide the full set of attributes of the Websites data bag items. Here are the missing ones, and uh, client ID is definitely one of them. So that means that I can't yet replace site key client ID with website dot client ID because that method does not yet exist. Not to worry, let's go ahead. Yeah, let's do this one by one. So here we reference site runtime. Let's take a look if there is a website dot runtime. Nope, runtime does not exist in here, so it goes into the list. <laughs> no, uh, this keyboard actually does not have any arrow keys. Um, I prefer the uh, this uh, small 60% layout. It's called the Happy Hacking Keyboard Layout because um, there are actual uh, keyboards of that name which introduced this kind of layout um, 15 years ago, I think, about that time. And um, so this layout actually um, tries to minimize the number of keys and thus minimize the... Um, required hand move movement. And um, since I'm using um, Vim key bindings, I can easily move my cursor with H, J, K, and L. 
And if I uh, need um, actual cursor or arrow key movements, I can do that by pressing the function key to the right here. And then I have uh, an arrow cluster on the right side of my keyboard, right left to the enter key. Um, and um, that way, um, many people consider this kind of keyboard layout more ergonomic um, and more um, uh, beneficial to your uh, health than uh, keyboards that actually offer an arrow cluster but uh, require you to move your hand off the home row all the time. Um, of course, it's even worse with reaching for the mouse. That's why I uh, do um, prefer Vim key bindings, even though I've replaced Vim with, uh, with VS Code. Um, I'm still using the Vim extension and that allows me to, to move my cursor without even moving my hands off the home row. As you can see, I can simply press J and go down and K to go up, so the, the usual Vim movements. These uh, small keyboard layouts rely on what's called layers. So you have certain special function keys that um, uh, switch uh, the, the keyboard to a different layer where you can have uh, all kinds of key bindings. And um, uh, most of the keyboards I build are um, using the same kind of firmware. Um, these keyboards use what's called QMK. That's an open source keyboard firmware. and uh, this uh, firmware uh, allows me to redefine my keyboard mappings as I see fit. Of course, I'm still able to manipulate and edit text. Um, that's what I'm paid to do. Um, uh, that's uh, what uh, Vim does. Um, in Vim, you switch between modes, and uh, here I am in normal mode, which means H, J, K, and L move my cursor, and I can do all kinds of more sophisticated stuff as well. And if I'd like to modify things, I use a keyboard command to um, uh, enter, for example, insert mode by pressing I. I can always go into insert mode, and now H, J, K, L, R, H, J, K, L. Um, and with the escape key, um, I switch back into normal mode and I can move stuff or mark stuff for deletion or, or things like that, as you can with every editor. Vim is quite... Uh, well, re rim, Vim requires a lot of um, rethinking things and I was very reluctant to do so. Um, I. I got in touch with Vim um, right when I started using Linux back in the early 90s and uh, I struggled with Vim the same way as almost everyone does. I got into a Vim editor by accident and then had um, lots of problems getting out of it again. Um, and I did not touch Vim at all for um, 10 or 20 years. Um, until I realized it would be very handy to at least have a basic understanding of Vim because that's the editor that's installed on any Unix or Linux uh, server that you encounter normally. Um, so just to make quick changes to a configuration file or things like that, um, Vim um, was pretty appealing and I thought well let's get at least a basic understanding of this editor with say being able to move the cursor around and uh, go into insert mode, insert something, and then press escape to get out of um, insert mode again. Um, and if I'm not in insert mode, I can, for example, press um, uh, shift D to delete the rest of my line here again. Um, so things are pretty easy if you start to memorize them. Um, and the more I got into Vim, the more I actually uh, liked what I saw. And um, so that then led over the years to me making Vim my default editor. And now that I've switched uh, to VS Code for my coding, because it's built for a graphical interface, which Vim is not, um, uh, I'm still using Vim key bindings because um, I'm, I find them superior to anything else that I uh, know. Of course, it always helps to memorize the key bindings of 
any editor, regardless if you are using Vim or Atom or um, PHP Storm or whatever, um, but uh, Vim is universal and um, almost any editor will support Vim key bindings, at least in a basic way. So um, it's, in, in, in my eyes, it's an investment that you make uh, in order to be very flexible and uh, use any editor you encounter quite quickly, productively. And what I can do with this keyboard, for example, uh, let me pull up the configuration software. I could, for example, if I wanted to use the Vim uh, arrow keys as actual arrow keys in macOS, I um, could redefine my spacebar here. Let's go into uh, the layers menu. Um, I ha already have a, a layer two defined here where H, J, K, and L are defined as arrow keys. But at the moment, to get into layer two, I would have to press the right Alt key down here. So if I do that, and um, maybe let's just go into here, I can actually use the left um, Alt key and uh, use H, J, K, and L and it works as the arrow keys normally do. However, as you can see, I'm really straining to uh, press this with a single hand. I have to stretch out my pinky far to the right, and uh, that's not really ergonomic, is it? So what I can do is redefine my spacebar to space function two, which means if I press my spacebar once, It'll insert a space. If I hold the space bar, it switches to layer two. And if I let go of space, we are back in level one, so the keyboard behaves normally, and space again inserts spaces. And that way I can use the whole width of the spacebar to access my layer two definitions. Um, and uh, that's pretty nifty. The only reason I'm not having this active at the moment, and I'll redefine space to normal space again, is because I use this keyboard for playing World of Warcraft as well. And um, there this uh, special space behavior is a little bit distracting or unpractical. So that's one of the advantages of building your keyboard yourself. Uh, it allows you to do a lot more things than the off-the-shelf keyboards. But let's get back to uh, our task at hand, which is to um, simplify this Apache script here. So site runtime is not available either. That's a pity. Here we are referencing site PHP version. So let's go ahead and do the same here. Unfortunately, PHP version is not available as an accessor nor as a method. So let's add it to the list. Unfortunately, this list is getting longer, but uh, well, that's uh, what needs to be done. Let me switch these tabs here so I can stick with my keyboard easier. Um, so where else do we reference stuff from the site hash? Here we have site cluster. And cluster is defined here. So instance variable set will actually define an accessor named cluster. So instead of using site hash key cluster, and uh, let me demonstrate how, how easy things are with uh, Vim and its normal mode where I can access commands. I'd like to replace site square brackets cluster with uh, website dot cluster. Um, 
of course I can, could you delete this uh, character by character, but I can also tell Vim, delete everything inside these curly braces and um, then insert my website.cluster. I can even be more uh, fast by uh, saying change everything inside these curly braces. Uh, and that's C for change, I for inside, right curly brace for curly braces. And then I'm already in insert mode, as you can see down here. And I can type website.cluster. So CI curly brace deleted everything that I needed deleted and allowed me to enter the replacement right away. And that's one of the things that I really, really like about Vim. It makes things very efficient once you memorize these commands. And they are um, <coughs> built in a very logical way, which makes memorizing them quite easy, to be honest. Okay, let's go ahead and look for more references to the site hash. Here, for example, we have site webmaster. I can switch between tabs with a G lowercase t to switch a tab to the right or G uppercase t with a, to, to get to a tab to the left. So again, I don't have to reach for the mouse. I can simply use uh, Vim commands. So is webmaster something that is available already does not look likely. Nope. So back to our issue here, we need webmaster, webmaster. Is environment available? <coughs> Wow, I was really lazy when I defined this class. I could have added them right away. And I did not. Pretty disappointed from by, by past me. Okay, so environment. At least we can resolve a lot of stuff uh, with a single change. Site Apache Custom is not going to be available either, is it? Let's look for Apache pattern not found. Well, that was to be expected. Apache Custom. How about Site Status? Nope. Oh, that's so sad. Um, let's simply search for site open square brackets, site status. Nope. Here we have site environment. We already discovered that that's not available. And now we are back to the start. So we've actually identified all the attributes that we need to make available. Let's apply our cookbook name as the label. In this case, this is a fry steel box data. And somehow it does not yet exist. Oh, it's cookbooks. Fry steel box data. No, does not exist. That's strange. Okay. Cookbook, fry steel box data. How is there not a label for this already? And I'm not sure about the color. Uh, it's not this strong pink, it's more a uh, different pink, but we'll create it with this. I can always change that later. And that's going to be an enhancement. So that's that. Let's go ahead and quickly fix the, the uh, color of this label. So let's copy this color from an existing entry. 
and then uh, we'll save it for this as well. Interesting. Really, this this label did not exist. Hmm. Okay, it was time to create it then. All right. So we haven't changed much yet. Let's see. Well, at least I was able to uh, replace the normalized site ID call with the site hash by Freisterbox uh, with the website ID. And maybe I can even um, improve that further by making, sh making sure that we actually need this normalized site ID. I think I know what this does. It takes the site prefix off, which means what's le going to be left is the ID, the number of the website. And uh, that's exactly what the site number method in our class does. So, we can actually replace this whole method call here with a website dot site number. I can delete everything to the parentheses, dt open parentheses. Then I can uh, re uh, uh, remove the parentheses in a single stroke, which is ds parentheses. And now I jump to ID and replace that with a site number. And I guess the, the next uh, improvement step would be to replace all occurrences of site underscore ID by website dot site number. And uh, I think... I'm going to do that. So, let's take a look where this occurs. Site ID, in this case, let's all replace that website site number. Here we have site ID. I can simply press the dot to repeat the last change. And now we've replaced all occurrences of site ID with our website class and uh, at least one variable le less in this source code. And now we'll have to do that for all these variables. And in the end, there will only be the website object left. And that's going to be awesome. So things should still be working and I'm going to run a test now. Wait, I'm in the wrong directory. And the first test will already fail because I haven't bumped my version yet. <coughs> I would say this is a patch level change because it does not change any functionality, 
we actually make uh, have to make sure that it does not change any functionality. Um, so um, I'm simply going to bump this cookbooks version by one patch level, 9.1, which will make this test pass. And while this test is uh, going to run, which will take quite a while, um, I'll take a quick break. I'll be right back.
And as you can see, the tests so far seem to be successful. So we did not break anything with um, the refactoring. Which makes me quite relieved. So, where do we go from here? I guess the um, next step, if this test is actually successful, is to tackle the issue that I've just created earlier to extend the website class to all the um, attributes that we need. And then switch back to our uh, current change here and uh, finish it. What do you think? Is that a good idea? Let me skim the code here. Yeah, as soon as we are able to replace the site hash so that it's only used as the iterator variable here and then it's used to create our website object and from there on we only use the website object. That's going to be a great improvement. And I guess we should also take a look at these local helper methods. Because if we can move them inside our website class as well, that will simplify things even further. A class is always better than helper methods. So that's also something that I've learned from Rails where helper methods are a quick way to simplify things and centralize things, but um, over time you are going to accumulate a lot of these helper methods and um, they might have a context contextual overlap or they might not, and um, there's no coherence in, in helper methods. Um, while in, uh, in a class or multiple classes, there is clear context, especially if you apply proper design patterns. And uh, so it's always a good idea to um, check your helper methods if they are actually helper methods or if they want to be methods of a proper class. And I can imagine that many of these things, especially if they end with for site, uh, they want to be a method of the website object here. So I'm going to extend my um, library issue. To also cover the helper methods here. So that should be easy by uh, going to the issues for Fryce Box data. Since we've just created this label, there's only going to be one issue here. And then we can go inside um, on top of these <coughs> proxy methods. Uh, there are also a bunch of helper methods in. Uh, let's say Freisty box slash libraries slash what's the file called? Uh, recipe underscore helpers. Dot RB. That should also be methods of website. Bit of a noob question. I love noob questions. These are my favorite questions. Since I haven't used Chef before, do you write tests for the recipes as well or is that overkill? That's a great question. 
let me just uh, save this. The answer is a clear and resounding yes. Um, it's not overkill. Um, tests are never overkill. Um, you can build bad tests or um, ineffective tests, but uh, tests are never overkill. They are, they require additional effort, I give you that. But um, uh, having tests, in my experience, creates so much confidence in your code confidence strong enough to deploy on a Friday afternoon without fearing the wrath of your colleagues who are going to be on call over the weekend. Um, and uh, so, yes, we do have tests and that ex that's exactly what's running uh, in the background here. Um, these tests actually spin up virtual machines um, running Linux and then they install and run these recipes. And uh, then I have, uh, or we have uh, integration tests that make sure that a package that is intended to be installed has actually been installed. That um, a certain configuration file actually contains a specific line that we expect to be there. Things like that. And, um, this uh, test suite started as a little, little test suite with very simple tests and over time it evolved into a, a very uh, extensive test suite that um, now is able to tell us if our recipes are still doing what they uh, are supposed to do. Um, as always, and you can see all these tests have been green, 120 successful uh, integration tests that ran here. Um, and there are multiple test suites uh, for different use cases and things like that. So that's why this uh, whole test run is taking quite a long time. Um, doesn't matter, it can run in the background and um, eventually it's going to finish and tell me everything is still okay. And that's when I will um, submit my merge request and uh, be quite happy with it being deployed to production. Because um, the likelihood of uh, errors creeping in uh, is getting lower and lower with uh, each test that we uh, add to our test suite. So uh, having tests for your infrastructure code is just um, as important as applying other common software engineering principles. Um, yes, of course it is uh, uh, pretty important because, um, well, uh, this code actually um, pays my salary. And um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, we should have a test suite here. And it's very well worth the effort of writing it. So this just adds another facet to my argument that I made at the beginning of this stream, that uh, infrastructure code should be treated just as uh, any other application code. You should apply uh, design patterns, you should apply common principles, you should also use something like test-driven development, or at least have a test suite that you exercise and extend that you, where you add tests, for example, if you discover a bug that slipped through your previous test suite, extend your test suite to um, now test for this bug and make sure that it does never ever reappear. Um, that's uh, something that I wanted to uh, actually convey with this uh, stream today, uh, because I um, found this understanding far too late. Uh, this uh, whole um, chef infrastructure cookbook collection here uh, was many years old when I finally realized that uh, we can't handle them just like uh, short bash scripts uh, and instead have to apply the engineering skills that we have and that we use in other areas, for example, for developing uh, Rails applications or, or other stuff. Um, 
so it's it's not that we didn't have the skills we just didn't apply them here because we for some reason did not think it necessary it's nice to see so much green here and uh, this might actually be the last yep last uh, test um, that had to run so the whole test suite now finished successfully after 18 minutes um, which means that I apparently did not break anything at least nothing that is covered by our test suite there are still uh, many things that aren't covered by our test suite um, I'll, I'll admit that but um, so far so good yeah um, Heroku um, is very nice and that's where I uh, deploy our um, hosting dashboard to a rails application uh, that I'm uh, maintaining and um, yeah, Heroku takes care of all the operations stuff um, for you. And I appreciate that uh, because I don't want to uh, run Rails applications on top of all that stuff that we are running for our customers. Um, so I'll happily pay Heroku to, to take that off my hands. However, um, yeah, in, in uh, our own hosting infrastructure, of course, we need to take care of things ourselves. And um, so... Um, that's why uh, I try and improve. I, I'll try to lift our infrastructure code to uh, the levels that uh, we have in, in other areas. And that I'm pretty sure Heroku has behind the scenes as well. Um, they have a substan su substantial uh, engineering team or multiple engineering teams. And I'm pretty sure they uh, use the same principles with testing and uh, software design and things like that. In conclusion, I'd say better late than never. So um, uh, I'll continue with making these changes here. And um, after that, our code will be uh, quite a little bit better. So uh, with that done, can actually commit what I have so far let's uh, uh, be more specific these are scalar variable oh well then they're not all scalar variables they are just um, um hmm, how would i describe that single variables with uh, object method calls i think that makes more sense so, in order to make our infrastructure code more robust and maintainable, this change replaces a bunch of uh, single variables with method calls of a website object based on the website class from the Frystill bo box uh, data. Cockbook. And uh, I'll add a work in progress tag here. Let's push this. This will trigger um, a GitLab CI run. So the same test suite that I've already run locally here will now run on GitLab CI as well. And I hope to see the same results. And in the meantime, I'll switch to issue number 584. So I'll 
actually go back to master. And from here, I'm going to create a new branch 584 website class. And uh, the context for this change is the fries to box data cookbook. Well, it does not even well yeah of course it has to be a cookbook uh, to be usable by chef but uh, in the end it's just a library it's more like a gem than a cookbook actually um, but uh, that's more or less an academic distinction so yeah uh, I guess the most important thing is to simply extend this uh, list of attribute names and uh, that's quite easy because I can simply copy and paste this list and add it here. And I'll use the J. Um, wait, I'll use the J keyboard binding to join all these lines into a single line. description for this website class is um, provide information about a single fries to box website and that's why this does not have to these don't have to be accessors they can simply be readers Let's see what this spec file contains. There are a bunch of uh, issues here. That's why there are so many squiggly lines. For example, we're missing the frozen string literal comment at the top. What else is wrong? Block has too many lines. That's normal and to be expected from test files. So I guess we we'll should we should um, make an exception here. Metrics block length should be disabled for the spec directory. Do we have a Rubicop YAML? Yes, we do. Block length. Um, it actually says exclude spec. So why does it still apply it though? I guess we'll have to make this a little bit more specific because it's source something and then spec. The error messages that pop up in VS Code are mostly from Rubocop or from Reek. Uh, no, we don't apply uh, Reek to, to these files, I think. Oh, th we might actually be doing that because it's Ruby and the Ruby extension runs Reek. But um, what's... Um, Important for me is Rubocop because uh, I'd like to apply um, a, sp um, a consistent style guide to our cookbooks. So now 
Um, the uh, website spec here should not complain about block length anymore. Why does it? Do we have a RuboCop file locally here? No, we don't. We should not have one. Block length. We are in first minute. Slash spec. That's weird. Maybe if I reopen it. Ah, yeah, okay. Okay, so I guess we'll have to extend our our test suite here as well. Let me see. We create a test website. And that comes from support, I guess, test website. Yes. So we need to add a little bit more information here. In this case, the same information as we are adding to our class. Uh, here I can use a macro to extend these lines. So let's start recording a macro. We'll have to enclose these words with uh, double quotes. That's done by YSW double quote. Then I'll jump to the end of the line and insert an empty value and a comma. And then I'll jump to the next word and that's my macro and now I can repeat this macro ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba dum status for this website is supposed to be active and I'll move that to the top client ID um, we'll just use 10,000 and we'll put this uh, uh, to the top as well. Runtime, let's say we are using PHP dash 7.2. PHP version should um, be consistent with that. Webmaster is going to be webmaster at example.com. That's just the email address that gets put into the Apache. Configuration environment is uh, production and Apache custom is uh, mm, I guess we can simply add a comment. No op. That's actually a valid Apache configuration, and that's easy to test. Okay. Now that we've extended our source data, it's time to add that to our tests as well. So I guess I can again insert our list of attributes here and I'll create another macro where we say oops nope that's not what I'm going to say um, expect then I'm going to 
and close this with parentheses. Add website, jump to the end equals some string. Uh, end of macro. Dev Ham and OP, welcome to Full Stack Live. And that's a good question because we are talking about JSON here. Unfortunately, we can't have this trailing comma here. And uh, that's so annoying, isn't it? I do love to have uh, trailing commas everywhere. And um, fortunately, Ruby allows me to do that. Actually, um, I enforced this in my Rubook op, um, style guide um, that each array and hash element ends with a comma because that makes the list easily, easy sortab easily sortable. Um, I can always append lines without having to take care that there is an additional comma, uh, things like that. Um, and I, I find it pretty annoying that JSON does not allow that. Thanks for the hint. So um, I can simply repeat my macro here. Yeah, JSON is nice because uh, I, it, it enforces a certain structure that, for example, YAML does not. But uh, why, where other people have lots of uh, complaints about uh, uh, JSON, I think um, my only two complaints are that uh, I can't add comments. And that's... Uh, something that a certain viewer will uh, uh, must never know um, and um, yeah that I can't have trailing commas at the uh, in in the last element of a list so website client ID should be equal to 10,000 runtime was supposed to be PHP 7.2 and, and therefore PHP version 7.2 um, this is um, Redundant by intention, because um, uh, when we introduced the runtime attribute, it was supposed to replace PHP version. It does not, uh, it did not uh, do that actually, but uh, it's supposed to do that eventually. Webmaster is webmaster at example.com. Environment uh, was production and Apache custom. Wait, uh, is supposed to be no op. And status is supposed to be active. Here we go. <laughs> okay. Let's check if that's actually the case. I need to switch to my Freistabox data cookbook in the terminal as well. And uh, I guess rake test should run these tests. Ooh, nice. Okay, so this cookbook hasn't been updated in a while, and that's why Rubocop finds a few things to complain about. Let's fix them. The rake file does not have the frozen... Uh, yeah, I guess most of them are missing here. So let's do... that. Where else do, is it missing? Edge router. Libraries website, we can actually open that from here. Spec libraries. Export. Okay, that should take care of most of them We're down to four offenses and now uh, we'll have to add that in i thought i added it in a rake file did i not oh wait i, I added it in burke's file well that's ruby as well so well, let's keep it Uh, 
And then we have a symbol array in the rake file. Yeah, okay, so that's um, violating our style guide in uh, multiple ways. Um, first of all, there shouldn't be spaces surrounding this list. And then since it's a list of symbols, it's uh, much easier to write as a percent %i list, where I can uh, simply use a list of words separate by spaces. And uh, so that's much easier to read with all, uh, without all these colons and uh, commas. Then we have uh, spaces inside array literal brackets. Uh, I, f I think uh, I fixed that in the same edit here. Yep, Rubocop is happy now. Now we have to have uh, a either um, a proper license or we should not check check that in uh, our food critic check. Food critic is uh, a test suite especially for chef cookbooks. And in this case, I'm simply going to uh, ignore the issue FC078 that checks the license. Um, that's an internal cookbook. Uh, it doesn't have to have a license um, other than uh, all rights reserved. Uh, no one is ever going to use this cookbook for anything else than its purpose uh, at the moment. So, um, is there already a food critic file? There is not, so I'm simply going to echo, ignore FC178 and add that to dot food critic. Dev Hum and OP, thanks for following. I appreciate you. Welcome to Footstack Live. So, uh, now we are running our spec. And there's something going wrong here as well. And uh, I'm not sure what is going wrong, but it's failing in rake file 9. I guess it's because we are not using bundle exec, huh? Am I right? Yeah, we are using chef exec and uh, we are not using the chef uh, SDK anymore for um, licensing reasons. So uh, we use the standard gems here. So I'm going to run it as bundle exec. That should take care of things. Oh, look at that. Yeah, of course we can't. Well, yeah, require chef spec. So we are not installing that in our bundle. That's one of the few cookbooks where we actually use chef spec, which is our spec for chef cookbooks. Um, that's different from the integration tests that I've been running earlier. Um, these full integration tests that require spinning up a VM and all these things, that's a, a tool called Test Kitchen. You can probably now um, uh, recognize a pattern here. Um, chef spec itself is just basically uh, um, a little uh, RSpec extension that checks uh, chef recipes. So um, yeah, we ac apparently don't have chef spec in our list here, which uh, we actually don't, yes. So let me install that quickly. Gem install chef spec, just to find out what uh, version um, I should enter. Working on moving from development to DevOps in your company. You haven't had experience in them yet. Yeah, so uh, welcome to my world. <laughs> and if there's anything I can explain, please, please um, interrupt me and, and ask away. I'm more than happy to explain things. So ChefSpec 9.1. Uh, I'll be optimistic and assume that's um, semantic versioning, so I can actually use chef spec um, 9.1. So we'll just stick with version 9 and uh, that should keep us safe. And now I should be able to run rake test without issues. But still can't. Yeah, okay. Chef spec requires Chef 14, and we are still using Chef 13. So I need to find a Chef spec version that um, uh, supports Chef 13. So I assume that version 8 um, is going to support that. So let's install uh, Chef spec v8. 
8. Oh no, it's the uh, dash V8, I guess. Dash V8. And that's uh, Shaspic 8.0. Oh. So we have to fix our gem file here. Instead of 9.1, we're going to use 8.0. Uh, oh, oh right, the executable. Uh, yes, please. Okay, let's see. Rate test. Still doesn't work. Even Shaspic 8 requires chef 14 interesting so we have to go further into the past here how about version 7 if version 7 doesn't work either i'm going to uh, take a look at the change log and find out which version they did make the jump there but uh, let's see 7.0 quick test And we are in business. Fine. Okay, so this uh, error is a different one. Uh, we can close the gem file. Our versioning is intact now. So let's close. I guess I will close all the open files here. We are using LE enabled, and it's actually LE enabled A. Interesting that this breaks. Ooh, and look at that. Here we actually use the attributes as writable. I'm not prepared to make them writable just so I can write these tests. I'd rather change the test setup here. And in this case, I'll just extend the test website method to accept parameters in the form of a hash where we actually um, set these values. We merge the hash that we pass in with the hash that we are using here with the website data back item and that should take care of things so uh, here um, we'll say raw data equals uh, this one here But uh, we'll merge it with uh, the attributes hash that we pass in here and make M an, M an empty array by default. So that way. We should be able to say test website. LE enabled. True. And here we can have trading commas because we are in Ruby. So let's run this. And this time it works. It just uh, complains that we haven't bumped our version yet. We can do that. And that's going to be a minor change. But actually, if I'm honest, I'm, I'm making a breaking change here by uh, removing the writability from my attributes. I sincerely hope that we aren't using this uh, this uh, feature in quotes 
in production. But it's a breaking change, let's be honest, let's be real. And that way I can actually deploy this uh, without fear of, uh, of breaking anything, because uh, where we use this as a dependency, we will have um, uh, pinned that to version 1. And therefore, uh, we shouldn't have any issues. All right, so let's grab some tea here. Let's try and run our test suite again. Interesting. It uh, tries and run. Uh, it tries to run kitchen test, and we don't have an integration test suite at all. Why does it do that? Oh, because the default task in our central rake file actually defaults to something different. Well, it defaults to test. And here we actually overwrite it, or try and overwrite it, but we can't. So how about I put this up here before I import the central and global rake file. Still try to run it. Interesting. Hmm. That's the first time I'm trying to uh, override an, a, a rake task. First of all, this should not be called R spec, it's called chef spec because we use chef terminology here. But that will not fix the issue. So the first part runs okay, goes until uh, the chef spec run, and then the central rake file takes over. So I guess we should actually. Um, here we define test. Okay. Interestingly enough, it runs them both. So let's look up how rake tasks get to stack on one another. Rake task redefine. Redefine a red great task. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. I'll actually have to call rake application redefine task. Interesting. And uh, I guess. Hmm. 
I'm not too fond of this uh, kind of hack. Let's see. By default, rake talks append behavior every time they are defined. The following is um, okay. I like this behavior, but sometimes you want to override a task instead of appending to what's already there. When you no longer want the existing behavior, the override method can come in handy. That sounds much better. Yeah, that sounds much better and much less complex. Let's try overwrite here. So we can simply say break task test overwrite do. That sounds good. So let's insert this up here. And I guess we should also require the necessary gems here, at least require rake. So we'll monkey patch overwrite into here and then we can say um, rake task test overwrite um, can we actually pass in a list of symbols here not sure if that is going to work because that's not how it's done in the in the example. We'll see. Don't know how to build task test. Hmm. Maybe I'll have to take a different approach then. we can actually do something specific or we can abandon the rake test task altogether I guess override, yes, of course, override expects a block, and that's why it does not work. If we have just a list, can I call enhance with a list? Nope. And that's in line 14. Okay, guess we'll need a cleaner appro approach to things here. Okay, that's something that I'll fiddle with because that is going to affect all our co uh, cookbooks. If I make changes to our central rake file, that's going to affect uh, how um, all the rake tasks for our cookbooks are going to run. And that's something that I'm not taking lightly. Um, 
that will take a little bit of experimenting and uh, trying things out and finding a proper way to do things. Um, still, I'm quite happy. I can't release my change yet because the, the test suite is going to fail in CI and um, so I m might only be able to release that manually if I want to take a shortcut and I'll have to think about that as well, maybe discuss it with uh, with my colleague. Um, uh, I'll do that uh, outside of this stream. I've been going on for quite a while today and I'm quite happy where it uh, took me. We are uh, on the way to get a little bit more structure in our cookbooks, which is important. So I'll, I'll close the arc uh, of this stream uh, by saying make sure you uh, apply software engineering principles to your infrastructure code as well even if your infrastructure code is only a bunch of shell scripts um, you can uh, apply the same kind of principles to shell scripts as well of course um, it's going to be easier if you uh, use an actual programming language like i do here with ruby and uh, everything based on chef um, but still, um, think about things and think about maintainability. Um, I should have expected my code to last for many years, back when I started this infrastructure code more than 10 years ago, um, because <laughs> it's, it's my own company. I should have expected it to last. Um, uh, I guess uh, uh, as a co-founder, <laughs> you should have that kind of optimism. But um, uh, uh, I'll admit that I did not have the, the same level of uh, software engineering experience back then. So um, hindsight is always 20-20 and um, a better late than never, as I mentioned earlier. Um, this is going to be a nice series of changes. Um, I'll get these um, details here sorted in the next few days and I'll be back. Well, yeah, I'm going to be back tomorrow, actually. Uh, so um, I guess I'll um, continue where um, I left off today. Maybe I can uh, resolve a few of these detail uh, uh, issues in the meantime. We'll see. If not, I'll pick up uh, uh, exactly at this point tomorrow. Now, shall we raid someone? Uh, it's always nice to raid people and... Uh, expose uh, you as the viewers to a few more people uh, so I'm going to take a look at our team the live coders and who's online at the moment there's Lana as always she's such a prolific streamer I, I really admire her uh, she does her streams almost daily I think and uh, I'm very envious of uh, how she does things and I aspire to be as good as she is eventually so I guess um, let's stick with uh, someone who has not as many viewers um, I'll I'd say how about Jason over here contribute to open source projects that's an interesting topic and Jason and Justin uh, are certainly having a lot of insight there so let's do that uh, slash raid uh, here we go as always, if you don't yet follow the stream, please do so. You'll get a notification when I'm going to be back tomorrow. And um, uh, you can also follow my Twitter account at Chiwiz. And uh, until next time, thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.